Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a special early look at No Rest for the Wicked. This is an upcoming top-down action RPG from Ori developer Moon Studios. As with their prior games, their hope is to bring a unique twist and new approach to an already established genre. No Rest for the Wicked aims to deliver brutal precision combat as you fight through plague-ridden monstrosities while exploring this dark, grim world that's entirely handcrafted, intricately interwoven, and full of random generated loot. So recently I got the chance to sit down and play an early version of the game as part of a sponsored campaign. The developer asked me to check it out, put it through its paces, and then just do my thing, which is share with all of you what I saw, what the game's all about. That's exactly what we're going to do here today. So for starters, what kind of a game is this? Well, between it being called an ARPG and the over-the-head camera perspective, you might be led to believe that you're getting another Diablo or Path of Exile, but the truth is, No Rest for the Wicked shares much more of its DNA in common with the Soul series than it does with any traditional hack and slash ARPGs. And I'm not just referring to the action combat here or the dark tone and setting, although those are here as well. For one, the game's got all of the expected combat tools, uh, weapons with attack chain combos, light and heavy attacks, blocking parries and dodge, backstab that you can perform mid-combat by circling your target, and an array of conditional attacks with unique movesets for any attacks made while sprinting, dodging, and falling. So yes, all of those Souls-like combat similarities do exist, but then also there's the things like the handcrafted dark world and setting, with the static levels that have this interwoven design we're talking a whole lot of circling back into, over, and under locations. Pretty much no matter where you go in the game, odds are it connects to somewhere that you've already been, or somewhere that you'll be in the future. You'll come across plenty of locked doors that require keys, ladders that you can't climb until they're kicked in position from up above, or bridges that you can't cross until you find your way around to the other side and lower them. Even how they handle gear and upgrades is similar. Every single weapon in the game will scale with one or more particular attributes, and those attributes are boosted by spending points whenever you level up. And the fact that you will find armor and weapon shards that are used at a blacksmith to upgrade said gear. The game even has equipment loads as well, based on how heavy the gear that you're wearing is, it's going to put you in one of three load categories, which then impacts the distance and speed of your dodging. Aside from the fact that they don't have a similar mechanic to souls, like this experience that you collect and drop upon death, and that they don't have this bonfire resetting mechanic, a lot about the rest else of the game does fall in line with the structure and systems and mechanics that you expect from a Souls-like title. So at this point, I think it should be pretty obvious No Rest for the Wicked feels a whole heck of a lot more like a top-down Souls game than it does a Diablo or Path of Exile loot grinder, although there is also loot in the game with different rarity stats and perks that drop at random from the enemies and treasure chests you find. You actually, in fact, never know exactly what you're gonna get in terms of loot. Every single run, the loot drops that come from enemies and loot chest will be entirely different. So I guess in that sense, uh, yes, it is is also kind of like a loot grinder. As I said at the start of the video, Moon Studios is clearly looking to put together their own particular amalgamation of things here. So what I played of the game, which amounted to, I think at this point, between 10 and 15 hours of playtime, it, it was actually just the intro of the game. This was actually the total amount of content was about 90 minutes worth if you spent your time exploring and checking all of the nooks and crannies, searching around for new locations, as well as enemies and treasure chests, or it could also be as short as five or 10 minutes if you didn't bother with any of that, didn't care to level, didn't care to explore or look for gear, and you just beelined it from the start of the game straight through to the location's end boss, completing the only two critical objectives that must be done in between. Over the past couple of days, I have played through this level over and over and over again. Like I said, it's amounted to somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15 hours, and each one of those runs was a little bit different than the last. In fact, the only thing that's really static about this is the level design and the placement of the enemies, but the longer that I played, the more I kept coming across and discovering entirely new locations that I hadn't seen in the prior hours of playing in all of those prior runs, and much of this is due to how they have built and structured the world and these individual levels. So let me walk you through what I'm talking about. Uh, the game opens up with you washed up on a beach, you pick up this little horn laying beside you before setting off to explore, and from here you can head in whatever direction you want, exploring the surrounding environment 
Department, this beachfront area called the Shallows, or if you please, you could just follow the main path straight ahead and, as I said, easily finish this section of the game in under 10 minutes. And it would basically look like this. You wash up on the beach, you walk straight ahead to find this NPC who's also washed ashore. He tells you to head further into Mariner's Keep. From there, if you walked straight up through into the keep, you would fight a handful of enemies before entering into this courtyard. At the end of that courtyard is a closed gate with some guards. You kill the guards, they drop a key for a locked door south of you. Opening that door, you would find and fight a few more enemies, thus rescuing an NPC who gives you the lever to open the closed gate, and then walking through that gate has you leaving the keep into the Orban Glades. You fight a few more enemies, you meet a father and daughter duo sitting by a campfire, and then some like 50 yards away from that, up the main path, you've got the final boss encounter. Beating that boss lets you then progress further into the game, or at least it would in my particular situation for this test that I was doing. This was actually the end of the playable area and it would it would restart it for you if you walked up to the bridge after the boss. Now what I just described would basically be like a speedrun version of playing through this game, which could easily be done in under 10 minutes without question. But as I said, there was at least 90 minutes worth of content in this section that I played if you were really thorough with what you were doing. And here's what I'm talking about. When you first wash up on that beach, while you could sprint straight ahead, you can also just start walking east. Doing this, you would see a bunch more shoreline, all sorts of rocky mounds, a bunch of different crabs to fight, some cooking resources to gather, and then if you headed slightly away from the water, you would come across this large rock face. Along that rock is a wall of wooden planks. You smack that a few times, it burst open, revealing a tiny hidden cave with some loot inside. Walk out of the cave and continue east, you'll find more resources and loot, including a chest hidden behind a waterfall. You'll also come across various sections of the map that are just out of reach as the camera tilts and pans out ever so slightly to show you areas and loot that you will eventually gain access to as you keep playing. Going back to where you started, if you head west, you'll find this enemy by the water. Kill them, get some loot. North of that enemy is a tower that can be climbed with chest and loot drops all the way up. Atop that tower and across a small plank bridge is a large enemy protecting a chest. If you head back down past the NPC who gives you the quest, you've got multiple options and access points for entering Mariner's Keep. The most obvious obvious access point is just past the bridge up an incline through this blown open section of the wall. This will walk you straight into a combat encounter with a patrolling guard. However, alternatively, if you head slightly south before entering that blown open section of the wall, you'll go up onto a ramp which then leads you to some vines that you can climb up into a tower. There you can stealth take down an oblivious guard and get a nice loot chest before dropping down into the section with that patrolling guard. Or you could sneak past that guard up on the left side to another entry point into the keep. Here you'll find more groups of enemies. Up in the far left corner of this section is a tower, which if scaled all the way down will lead you through more enemies, more loot, and eventually down to the water, which you can jump in swimming south, coming ashore right behind the tower we climbed earlier on the western side of the beach. If it isn't obvious yet, this is not a linear straight from point A to point B kind of a game. It can be that, just like in Souls games, how you can boss rush, there is so much more interwoven in between. While you are playing in rather confined spaces, these have been designed and crafted in a way that allow for tons of freedom of movement within every area, and your character can pretty much go and navigate, climb, pull up onto, jump across, anywhere where it naturally seems like you should be able to, simply by moving in the direction and hitting A on the gamepad. All throughout this play space are tons of hidden locations locations, entrances, and pathways that circle back into other parts of the level. I would say one of the biggest things that stood out to me while playing this game is their heavy use of vertical space. In fact, as far as I could tell, there might even be more vertical traversal space than horizontal space. There were just so many stairs, ladders, vines, ledges, and elevators moving you up and down the environment. Like in one confined horizontal area, say an area that might take you like 20 seconds to traverse from left to right, 
there could also be 20 plus minutes worth of additional space to explore if you do more than just go from left to right. Uh, give, I'll give you another example here. Towards the end of this level that I had access to play through, you come across that father and daughter duo sitting by a campfire. So like I mentioned earlier, if you just walk by them taking the main path, you'll come across the final boss encounter literally like 10 or 15 seconds away. So you could just chat with the family, walk down the main path straight to the boss and kill the boss and be done with the level. In fact, I think a lot of people on their first playthroughs, that's probably what will end up happening. But all around them, up, down, left, right, to every single side, are bunches of additional uh, spaces to be explored. So just past the duo, north of the path, is this little outcropping with a tiny pond. If you walk towards the back of the pond, there's a wooden wall. You attack that wall, it breaks open into a decently sized cave. Inside of that cave, you got a handful of these plague-infested enemies, a large elite enemy, and a few treasure chests, which almost always had good loot whenever I opened them. And then if you headed south of that path, there's actually another pond outcropping. You'll find all sorts of different crafting resources there, as well as some loot to pick up. And then heading slightly west reveals this large hillside and tower that you can climb up with, of course, as you expect, loot and enemy inside of those as well. If you go back to the campfire and instead of walking down to the path, you head slightly northeast, you actually find yourself on a ledge that leads to some vines you can climb all the way up and up and up until you arrive at the top of this hilltop far above the rest of the level with several new paths, enemies, and yes, loot for you to find. Going back down and going just left and south of the campfire is the elevator that you took to reach them. If you drop down underneath the elevator and flip the switch a second time, it actually then carries you downward into a hidden lagoon that you would have not found had you not done this in this specific manner. All of these areas that I just described, like mere feet away from the campfire and the main path leading to the boss. Those could all be so easily missed or skipped if you didn't bother looking around you. And that is really one of the things that, as I said a moment ago, has just stood out so much to me while playing this game. So much verticality, so many hidden areas, nooks and crannies everywhere in between. And to help hint at all these hidden locations and tucked away spots is the fact that when you pull up the game's map, every area of the map is specifically named and comes with a percent completion rate next to it for the individual sections. So if you spent a bunch of time exploring Mariner's Keep and you thought you saw everything, but you pull up the map and it says you've only uncovered 50%, you know there's a lot more poking around and areas for you to find. This is the thing that really, really stood out to me, but everything else is, like I mentioned earlier, rather straightforward. You got the Souls-like action combat, you get some randomly generated loot, and a few other things. Let's run through that really quick here. In terms of the combat, it is that action combat more akin to Souls than AR RPG. You've got light attacks with chain combos as well as a charged heavy attack. You have the ability to parry and block depending on the weapons you're using. You have a dodge that's affected by the equipment load that I mentioned earlier. You can sprint, roll, and also do dropping attacks. There are backstabs. You can do this either by actually crouching and stealthing, sneaking up to an enemy who doesn't see you, or while you're fighting them, if you just swing yourself around and position yourself behind them after they've, say, committed to an attack and are in a recovery period, you get behind them, you get yourself a free backstab for additional damage as well. In addition to all of this attack variety, weapons can also have special abilities on them. These are called runes, and as you engage in combat, you build up this meter known as focus, and that's essentially your resource that you spend on casting runes. Different rune attacks will have varying focus cost attributed to them. So I found, for example, swords that would have a heavy hitting slash attack, a dagger that would have this lunge forward dashing attack, or I even found a magical staff that had three attacks on it, a fireball, an AoE fire slam, and the ability to blink. Combat in this game, like other Souls likes, is really just about not over committing. It's about playing the tempo of the enemy. It requires you reading or remembering their attack pattern and cadence. It's the same sort of dance that you're used to if when fighting enemies in Souls games. If you spam attacks, you will in fact be punished. This applies across the board to the normal enemies that you see, melee and range, to heavies, to elites, and the one boss that we had access to fighting here, it was all pretty much the same. Watch them, then dodge, block, or parry, then counter attack. And once you get comfortable with the enemies and their attack patterns, you can play a little more aggressive and know when to back off. The game also utilizes this soft lock system where it will auto face towards the nearest target that your character is facing. It's felt pretty natural and normal. Uh, I didn't feel like I needed the ability to manually swap between them, although I think the option would be nice if the developer were interested in adding that in. And then 
then also, like I mentioned, there is a, a whole loot side to this game. This isn't a loot grinder at all, like tr like a Diablo or Path of Exile or Last Epoch, but it does have loots with different rarities and attributes. Every single run through that I did, whenever I would open a chest or kill an enemy or an elite or kill the final boss, every single time the loot that dropped and the combination of items was completely different. Uh, it seems unlike the Souls games, which have those predetermined loots that you can go after, like you know this specific uh, dagger will drop from this specific corpse. That's not how it works in No Rest for the Wicked. They employ the randomness of ARPG drops and that randomness is gonna guide whatever build or playstyle you have access to depending on what you happen to find. Uh, the only exception to this randomness as far as I could tell were the keys for locked doors. Those keys did seem to drop from very specific sources but all of the loot, the armor, the weapons, the materials, the consumables, all of that is random from every other stuff you pick things up from. So on the run where I found a strong two-handed sword I went with a strength build because that's what it's scaled off of. There was a run where I found a purple staff with three abilities that I mentioned earlier. You betcha when I found that I went with an intellect build. And in one of my most recent ones, I found this super sick one-handed mace that scaled with faith. So I went with a faith build and threw on a shield. Every single playthrough, what I would build my character off of was entirely dependent on whatever good drops I happened to find early on. I think this will be less the case when the game is fully out because... Uh, I'm just playing this one small section, roughly 90 minutes of content when thoroughly explored. And so I just had to roll with what I got. I imagine when the game's fully out, you can have a build in mind and just wait until you get a piece of gear that works towards that. But that's just how it worked for this kind of particular hands-on session that I had access to. Um, and then also, yes, loot uh, also has rarities. So what I saw were white basic items, then blue and purple ones, purple ones having more and better attributes on them. And they came with a, an assorted a variety of perks and skills pretty much the expected assortment of like offensive and defensive boost to your character some interesting uh, stuff here and there the game does have progression although we didn't have access to everything in this vertical slice that we played but fundamentally you will be gaining experience as you play and kill things there's also experience potions that you can chug to gain some additional experience whenever you level up it increases your stats and then also grants you grants you three skill points where you can spend either in stat increases for your health stamina or equipment load in the weapon and damage scalers, which are strength, dexterity, intelligence, and faith, or you can spend it in upping your focus, which then grants you additional focus bars for every 100 focus you have. And that's, again, that's your ability resource. Uh, think mana, more or less. More focus means more ability usage after you build it up. You've also got defensive stats modified by the gear that you wear. These include armor, poise, and elemental resistances. And as talked about earlier, the game does employ weight class of light, normal, and heavy, which is impacted by the gear that you're wearing depending on the class that you fall within, that's going to determine how your dodge roll effectiveness is. They also had this interesting mechanic where if you are a heavyweight class, while dodge rolling, you can, I don't remember, but there was another bind you could hit, and it turned the dodge roll into a shoulder bash, which is really interesting. Uh, kind of utilizing your heavy weight to actually offensively push through an enemy instead of dodging around them. Let's talk inventory. The main storage inventory is broken up into five categories, one for your gear, one for consumables, resources, specialty items and keys. You have a limited storage space. You can sell them to certain NPCs, stuff you don't need. You'll use them in doing things like crafting food. The game does have cooking as well. And then there's also your equipment slots. You've got uh, one slot for your main hand weapon. There were two of these unlocked by default. One for your offhand, two slots for that as well. And then there are armor slots for a helm, chest, pants, and glove piece. There's also ring slots and slots for gathering tools. The, the axe, shovel, pickaxe, and fishing rod are what I found. And yes, this game actually does have resource gathering. Wasn't much for us to do with it in this build, but I assume clearly that's going to play into the crafting later on as the game continues to expand and there's more game there to, to be played. And with that, that pretty much concludes our walkthrough and overview of No Rest for the Wicked. As I said at the top, what I wanted to do was give you guys a nice introduction and overview of what I saw of the game. Uh, just a basic fundamental understanding of what kind of game is it is, what is there to see, what is there to do. Uh, still a whole lot more to be seen and done. I'm looking forward to trying additional builds and versions of the game that have more content unlocked but this segment that we got access to for this video i enjoyed my time with it thank you again to
Galaxy Moon Studios for sponsoring this video. If you guys happen to like what you've seen here, are interested in learning more and checking out the game yourself, be sure to use my link in the de video description below. Also, they are going to be hosting the Wicked Inside Showcase. This is happening on March the 1st, which should be the same day this video is uploaded. Here, they're going to be diving into some more nitty, -ditty, uh, nitty gritty details on the game, so be sure to check that out as well. But that about concludes it for today. Thank you all, as always, for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Take it easy.